Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum, the leading authority on cyber, information security, and risk management. I'm Tavia Gilbert, and I'm so glad to welcome you back to another cutting-edge conversation tailored to CISOs, CTOs, CROs, and other global security pros. In every episode of ISF's media, CEO Steve Durbin speaks with rule breakers, collaborators, culture builders, and business creatives who manage their enterprise with vision, transparency, authenticity, and integrity. And he brings that conversation to you, your teams, and your partners. In today's episode, Steve speaks with Dr. Kate Stone, a creative scientist whose company, Novalia, blends art and science to create fusions of new and old technology. Dr. Stone speaks to Steve from her beautiful California backyard about the creative process, the role of analog in the digital age, data privacy, and more. Kate, lovely to see you all the way over in Los Angeles. You've had a really unusual career trajectory from struggling student to PhD and now, of course, innovative scientist. So tell our listeners about your journey, your work, and how you really arrived at doing what you're doing today. Oh, wow. I often never know how to answer that. Where did things start? I tend to take things quite literally and go back to the beginning. But yeah, I I did struggle at school and I managed to fail my English GCSE high school qualification twice and never actually passed that. And in my A-levels, you know, when I left school, I think I had a D in physics an N in maths and an N in design. And I'm not really sure what N stands for, but I tell people now it stands for not even. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I think it probably does. And then I went traveling and my parents kind of bought me what I say turns out to be a one-way ticket to Australia, see the back of me. And I traveled around Australia for several years, but I just really, really craved electronics and learning. And when I was a child, I used to play around with wires in my bedroom and you know, sticking electrodes into things that probably shouldn't have them stuck into them and blowing things up. And I, yeah, I just craved going to university. So I managed to travel my way all, all the way back to the UK and get into a university that didn't really want me. And I studied really hard. And then I realized I didn't really want that university. So myself and a few others left and went to Salford and moved to the second year there. And I just studied really, really hard. And I got a very good first class honours degree in electronics and then my world changed and I was offered funded PhDs at a couple of London universities in Cambridge and I chose Cambridge and did a PhD there in physics which was the physics of electronics so it was still electronics and I learned how to move electrons around one at a time which it turns out that when I'd worked in Australia I was moving sheep around because I ended up getting a job as a sheep herder for a few years in the far outback and um, realize that moving sheep and moving electrons are pretty much the same thing. You just need to know your environment and know how to alter things in your environment. And then the things in your environment will follow the flow of that environment that you've changed. And, you know, whether that's herding sheep, riding on a motorbike or moving electrons around in liquid helium temperatures, then it's kind of all the same thing, really. And then from that, there was a professor at Cambridge who had started a new business and it was how to print plastic transistors and I really wanted to join a startup and so I joined that as one of the first few engineers I think there was five of us in the beginning and I worked there for four years and the first two years were great and then politics kicked in and the second two years were not so great and so I left and took all my learnings really of just how I didn't want to do things (laughs) to create my own business in my garage And I was very lucky to get some government funding. And that was now 15 years ago. And I'm no longer in my garage. Well, I'm in someone else's garage now in LA. But my team is in the UK. So there's a team of seven of us. And we do some really interesting things with Conductive Inc. But really all about creating experiences. So kind of gone on this crazy journey, really, from failing school to being in a desert and traveling the world. And just I'm lucky to now have a formal education. But I know what it was like to not have that. But I also know that true education is far more than anything I learn at university. So that's kind of my journey there. Fantastic. And, you know, you've got, as you say, the team over in the UK, seven Mm -hmm. of them there. And and you're working in technology and that spans two very different 
some might think sort of divergent spaces, I guess, traditional print media and new media that makes paper interactive. You know, I've noticed certainly, having been locked up with the pandemic, how I've actually sort of turned back to paper. I've taken more to sort of writing, I've taken more to sort of sketching ideas out, whereas before I was entirely on screen. But I think that, you know, my question to you really is, what do you think is so compelling, attractive about print? Why are we still compelled to use it? And indeed, what led you then to do this sort of combination of, to come up with this interactive paper Mm. idea? Mm. Yeah, so, you know, whilst I have a deep fascination with technology and a deep understanding of technology and how to create things, there are the physical things that we create, which is, you know, things that exist. And then there's kind of the intangible, which is more like the, I guess, the energy that flows through things or that then becomes experience. So something like experience is not something that's necessarily tangible. And I think that an experience that we have becomes far more real to us than perhaps something that's physical. Probably not getting this across in the right way. It's a combination of things, right? So I just feel that everything that is around us is what creates half of our mind. This is more realization that I've come to really in the last year or so. And so I think anything that's physical can allow our experience to manifest in that thing. And we need a combination of those two things. And I think that when people talk about something that's digital, they will think of something like a smartphone or a computer. Those things are not really what digital is. They are the physical thing that digital manifests in. And so in a way, they are kind of almost old fashioned and clunky in a way of in the digital journey, because they are the only way that we can allow that digital thing to manifest. And so I really think that things that are more old fashioned, like pen and paper, print, things that we can touch and read, and things that allow our senses to connect with them in multiple ways, Because when we connect with something that's digital, we tend to have some of our senses switched off that we can't connect with. So we don't connect with all of our five known senses. Whereas things in the more natural world, we connect pretty much with all of our senses, right? You know, you have a book, feeling of the book, not just the feeling of the texture of the pages, but feeling of turning the pages, the smell of the book. I'm not saying you're going to taste the book, but, you know, we just have a much deeper connection with those things. And I think the digital portals that we have are just not yet sophisticated enough to allow us to have that deep an experience with a physical object. But I do believe that in the future, technology will have shrunk so much to the point that it becomes invisible. And once technology is invisible, it can then go inside anything. I also think that we have nostalgia for old fashioned objects, and we tend to design things often when we can and we're not trying to be futuristic, that look old-fashioned. And I think if you combine the desire for an old-fashioned world with invisible technology, then we will end up with a future that looks more like the past than the present. And it will have just the beautiful objects, like books will come back. They are coming back. Vinyl will um, become things where we want to have our experience. And so, you know, for that reason, I say I believe the future will look more like the past than the present. We'll have a future that looks more like the time of Merlin and Mary Poppins. And and we will have a magic wand (laughs) and we will be able to walk into a room and cast a spell and say something and something will happen. And a few years ago, those things sound weird, but you really can now walk into a room and cast your spell and Alexa will take care of whatever you need taken care of. So I think we have a desire for things being as natural as possible so we can connect with them through as many senses as possible. And also so that there is actually a little more friction in things. We tend to, and have done since the beginning of time, wanted to design friction out of everything, which is great. It makes us safer and stronger, amplifies our abilities. But once you've removed all friction from everything in your daily experience, you're not going to feel anything. And I think it's only friction that makes every moment meaningful, mindful, and memorable. And so building friction into things, you know, just in a book, having to turn the page, having to remember what page you're on, all these things, they make us think. When we think, we remember. When we think, 
we try to understand the why. And so that brings our mind into a sense of mindfulness. And so these are the things I've been thinking about a lot, creating old fashioned objects that have friction, that are still digital within, they have a digital soul that might connect them to the cloud, but it's invisible. Building that friction in and recognizing that everything in our environment is our mind. So I think that we have two halves to our mind, an inner mind in our body, and an outer mind is our environment. And we think using our environment and we feel using our environment. So our environment is incredibly important. And so the objects, journeys, and people in our environment are all part of who we are and how we think. And so that book or that paper and how you write on that paper and that pencil is part of your mind. If you find it easier to think and create your ideas by chewing your pencil and then pondering and then writing something on a piece of paper, that pencil and that paper is your mind because it is how you think. And without it, you wouldn't be able to have the same thoughts. And without it, we'd be like spiders without webs. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fascinating. And obviously, we're now seeing generations moving into the workplace. You know, we talk about Gen Z, we talk about the way in which you know, digital native and all of this kind of thing. And I think that that's very interesting, given what you've just been saying, because for some people, without what you term friction, they are perhaps existing in a somewhat frictionless environment in an environment that isn't real and you know there are all sorts of challenges around things like augmented reality virtual reality and so on what do you think some of the implications of what we are doing today from this digital frictionless environment what are some of the implications that that is having on not just workforce but on us as as people as humans well and it's a combination of the two things right it's being frictionless and it's removing half of our mind. So when we're no longer present in our physical environment in the same way, we've disconnected from half of our minds. And so I believe that it's literally driving people out of their minds. And I believe that the lack of friction is also preventing us from being as present and from us being able to, to sort of anchor ourselves into the rest of the environment. I just, I would say it's causing a lot of mental health issues. And I would say that not connecting into the physical world, not having that friction is probably contributing to really high suicide rates as well. And that's a little dark, but I do think so because if friction makes every moment meaningful, mindful and memorable, if you've now removed meaning, the ability to feel significant if you remove that from people where they no longer feel significant, no longer have meaning, I believe that that can cause severe mental health issues for people. And, you know, if our environment is half of our mind, then maybe curing our mental health isn't about taking some drugs necessarily to fix what's in here. Maybe we have to be fixing the environment that we're in and curating a more healthy environment for our physical bodies to be in. So, yeah, I think the worst extreme is significant mental health issues. But I also think just at the lower end, it's people not able to concentrate, people not able to necessarily have the ideas that they would have, people not necessarily able to communicate with other people in the way that perhaps they should, people not being able to communicate with people in an appropriate form. When we're used to the frictionless ability to unfurl hideous insults on people from behind a keyboard to people all over the world and there's no friction in doing that it curates some pretty awful human tendencies i think so i think there's a lot of impact that comes from that and, and yet we live in a society don't we where we have very much more technology around us watching everything that we do providing feedback to a whole range of different people. I mean, obviously, you can barely walk down a street in London without being picked up on a CCTV camera. Shoshana Zuboff, who was a speaker at our recent Congress, talks about you know, surveillance capitalism and, and the way in which the likes of Google, Amazon are, are taking over and influencing the way in which people see the world effectively. And that raises a number of questions, doesn't it, around privacy, the rights of the individual. What are your views on privacy? 
you know, I had a very unfortunate incident with privacy myself. A few years ago, I had a terrible accident and um, a deer ran into me and put its antler through my throat, which was pretty inconvenient at the time. Um, <laughs> um, and it led to me being airlifted in a helicopter and put in a coma for a while. But the tabloids decided to make the headline be about things in my personal life, make the headlines be about gender. And they wrote some pretty unpleasant headlines and personal details about me that are not part of my daily narrative. That's just, I happen to be trans and it's not something I normally think about. And they decided to um, make that public, which is not none of its secret. It's just that it's not really pertinent to the stranger that might be sat next to me in the hot tub at the local gym or you know there's details about all of us that may not be a secret mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily relevant in many situations and when that information is taken out of context and put in front of other people when it's totally inappropriate that becomes a miss use of access to our privacy. I have no problem with anyone knowing anything about me, anywhere I've been, tracking me in any way with any device. I really don't care. I have nothing to hide. But if that is taken out of context and placed somewhere where it shouldn't be placed, it can destroy somebody's life. So, you know, for me, seeing headlines on the front of a newspaper that say sex swap scientist gored by stag and that potentially starting to become the narrative that everyone has of me when it's not even a thing in my head is wholly inappropriate. So it's one thing having all of this data, I have no issue with that. But if the data, if the information is used inappropriately, I think there should be some serious comeback on this misuse of that. I was fortunate that what happened to me was so inappropriate that it only took a few calm and considered letters to editors of the newspapers to immediately allow them to realize that what they'd done was wholly inappropriate. I didn't get angry with them or threaten them in any way. I just pointed out that what they'd done had an effect on me. And once they saw that, they immediately removed the headlines and they um, apologized and just wrote me short notes admitting that what they'd done was wrong, which I took those notes onto Channel 4 and did a nice five-minute evening news piece with the headline. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote my own headlines. Um, the headline on Channel 4 News was six national newspapers admit they are wrong. <laughs> um, I did a nice headline on BBC News in Cambridgeshire, which, oh, and then they wrote it up as a piece of BBC News that I think was the most read piece of BBC News that day, which was the stag trampled on my throat and the press trampled on my privacy. So I'm like, two can play at that game. I can write some pretty good headlines <laughs> too. <laughs> um, but as a result, they, the newspaper industry invited me to sit on the Editor's Code of Practice Committee, where I sit as a member of the public. You know, whilst Paul Dacre was chair of that, I'd often sit next to him sometimes and he'd pour me a cup of tea and ask me how my previous few months were. So that was quite a journey. But ultimately, access to that information is one thing. But when it's inappropriately used, I think that is the issue. And I think that there should be more policing of how that information is used. And they should not, whoever they is, should not be able to hide behind any protection from misuse of personal information. I don't mind police or any sort of like MIX having any information on me, but if they misuse it, they need to go to jail. That's what I, what I feel about that. So how do we, do you think, step back from the position that we're in at the moment, I mean, you just talked very eloquently about your own situation. Um, I've had many conversations through this podcast series and outside of it with um, people like Anne Kavukian, for instance, who was one of the commissioners up in, in Canada. And Anne talks about the need for privacy by design, you know, building privacy controls into things from the very outset. But it does seem to me as if, to a certain extent, that the 
time to be able to do that has almost passed. And so my question really is, where do we go from here, given that there is so much information out there about us, it is being used in a variety of different ways, sometimes misused, sometimes not. But how do we regulate that? Yeah, I mean, so there's two aspects of it. You know, one is it's so easy to gather all the information, uh, to, to gather as much as possible. But I do think there needs to be consequences. And I think, you know, we need to recognize, I don't know if this is relevant. I'll tell a very short story. When I was a kid, I built a radio transmitter from a little kit on the back of a magazine. And I carved out the inside of my dad's favorite book, Captain Hornblower, hid the radio transmitter in it, hid the book next to my parents, went back to my bedroom, tuned in my FM radio, and Eve dropped on my parents. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard things that I can't unhear. And so the point is that once the cat is out of the bag, once you've heard something, once you know something, that has consequences. And so we should recognize that whilst we can gather as much information as possible on people, once the cat is out of the box, as it were, <laughs> as in the Schrodinger's cat out of a box, and you see what that information is, then it can have consequences. And so I think we need to build in a sense of, do we really need to know that information? Because once we do, it can trigger a series of events that no one intended to happen. So that's one aspect of consequence. And the other consequence is what I mentioned before. People who gather data and use that data and misuse that data often are legally protected from the things that they do from that information. And there are not consequences. And there should be consequences. So whilst maybe we can't now stop the tracking in as much as we would want to. I just think there should be harsher consequences for the misuse of information. And also people just understanding that, do you really need to know that? Because once you know that, you can't unknow that. So that's not necessarily an answer to everything, but when we live in a world where there are no consequences from spying on people, and then using that information and impacting people's lives. When there are no consequences to that, it's going to happen more and more and more. But once there are consequences, once we create an environment that has an impact on those that misuse data or inappropriately collect data, then they may choose not to do those things. How do we reintroduce, if I could put it that way, some of these guidelines? I mean, you, you talked about your own story. I mean, clearly you were able to demonstrate consequences to the newspapers and, and got them to apologize and took it on from there. When I asked Shoshana Zuboff the same question, she fell back on regulation, on the rule of law as being the ultimate in what we're looking to do in terms of reining things back. But based on your experience, how can an individual, let's bring it back down to that level, how can an individual really work through some of this quagmire of data, of information that's out there, some of which they perhaps would rather wasn't? What can they do about it? It's really, really hard as an individual to undo all of that. I, I do agree there needs to be regulation. It's too hard to expect every individual to be able to do something about that information that's been gathered. I was very, very fortunate that what happened to me was very specific. And you know when someone kind of crosses a line and you have caught them red-handed and it was just what they'd done was so obviously wrong. And I'm lucky that I have a very often calm nature and I'm able to convey to people why what they've done is wrong and has unforeseen circumstances. But, but so often it's always on a blurry line. And it's always difficult to prove and it's difficult to know where it came from. So, you know, to expect an individual to be able to unpick all of that is way too much when often they may be going through some other traumatic event that they don't want to have to deal with that. I do think it has to be a combination of regulation, you know, with actual consequences, but also just trying to better educate all of us in society that having that information and then having that information accessed can cause an undesirable chain of events to happen. And so, as well as regulation, can we actually start to think, do we really need to store that information? Do we really need to gather that information? Is it pertinent to what we're doing? Collecting everything, storing everything and making everything public 
isn't necessarily the right thing to do. We need to make that information a little more scarce. And gathering everything, making everything available is frictionless. There needs to be some friction built into that. You have to dig down and find that. The information about me was written on the front page of a newspaper read by millions of people. That information was available to any of those millions of people had they just gone and looked, Googled me, done a little search, gone to the Cambridge University website where there's a nice piece written about me about that, um, which is there for anyone to see. But it's not going to have just been read in the reception at the gym by the lady who sat in the hot tub next to me who doesn't want <laughs> to know. <laughs> there's no friction there. So there needs to be regulation, but we also just need to more of us recognize that having that information and making it public is something that we can not necessarily unhear once we've heard. So friction, so understanding perhaps some of the consequences of what we're doing, whether that be through storing information, how we use it. Mm -hmm. Those really are the sorts of things that we need to be focusing on very much more as we continue on a journey, I guess, into a digital world. And I suppose the message is we shouldn't just lose sight of what it is that makes us people. And that is, to use your words, probably a reintroduction of more friction. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Kate, look, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time from LA. It's very early in the morning there and uh, sharing your insights and also your helicopter noises and everything else that you've got <laughs> going on in, in LA at the all moment. Sorts. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Out of all of our episodes, I think this episode of the ISF podcast has had the most space for laughter, which delights me. In spite of the seriousness of topics we've covered today, including the importance of privacy and the consequences when basic rights to privacy are violated, the importance of digital friction in preserving mental health, what I take away from this conversation is the power of technology to allow us to play. I want to live in the future that Dr. Stone imagines and is working to create, a world that stays as natural as possible that calls on as many senses as possible, and rather than undermining our autonomy and our agency, gives us as much magic and possibility as Merlin and Mary Poppins. I hope you too can imagine new, healthier, happier digital possibilities. This episode concludes the second season of the ISF podcast, which has focused on leadership in a time of transition. We're going to be taking a short break, but we'll be back in a few weeks with the start of our third season, where Steve and our guests look closely at what lies ahead on the threat horizon. We look forward to bringing you that series of conversations. In the meantime, we invite you to tune into our catalog of video and podcast episodes, all of which you can find at securityforum.org. We invite you to subscribe to the audio feed wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd be very grateful if you'd recommend us. Growing our subscriber numbers helps us reach new audiences and continue to bring you these timely discussions. And if there's a topic you'd like us to cover or a guest you'd love to hear from, let us know on our LinkedIn page or get in touch directly through our website. Securityforum.org is also where you can download ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like these. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Associate producer, Katie Flood. Mix and master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening. <laughs>